Welcome to Thursdays at the Museum. I'm Ian Rapnicki from the DIA. Thanks for joining us today for part two of the tour of our Asian art galleries. Uh, don't worry if you've missed part one, though. We'll be looking at different objects today. If you have any questions during the program, don't hesitate to leave a public comment. If you're viewing on YouTube, you just have to make sure that you're logged in to leave a comment. If you're watching on Facebook, then you must already be logged in. So leave us a comment or question there. Questions will be moderated by the DIA's manager of volunteer development, Christine Mark, and we'll be checking in with her periodically. Uh, to guide us today on the tour, we're joined by docents uh, Frida Giblin, Jill Best, and Ray Henney. Thanks for being here, everybody. And I know you have a lot to cover today, so I'll just hand it over now. Take it away, Ray. Thank you so much. And we do have a lot to cover. I think this will be very informative. So as Ian just mentioned, this is the second of a two-part virtual tour of the DIA's Asian art collection. The DIA has an extensive collection of Asian art, which consists of over 7,000 objects. In uh, 2018, the DIA opened the new Asian wing on the north side of the first floor of the museum. The Asian wing consists of five separate adjoining galleries. There's the Chinese art gallery you can see to the left, and then there's the Korean art gallery, which is uh, in the center. Yeah, thank you, Kathleen. And then there's the Japanese art gallery to the top, the Indian and Southeast Asian art gallery, and then the Buddhist art gallery, which consists of art from various Asian cultures. Those galleries display about 140 objects, which are periodically rotated. Both modern and contemporary art are displayed in these galleries alongside ancient and historic pieces. Those Asian galleries are situated around a gallery dedicated to the DIA's wonderful Islamic art collection. Today, we're going to focus on representative pieces from two of the galleries, from the Indian and Southeast Asian Gallery and from the Chinese Art Gallery. Um, we believe you'll find these representative works to be beautiful in appearance and characteristic of the rich culture of the Chinese, Indian, and Southeast Asian people. Jill, will you start us off? Today, we're going to look at some Hindu gods and goddesses as displayed in the South Asian and Southeast Asian galleries. First, though, a few words about Hindu traditions. Hinduism is an ancient religion which originated in India about 3,000 years ago. Unlike other major world religions, there is not one individual founder. The Vedas are the earliest known Hindu scriptures, written in early Sanskrit and dating from about 1500 to 1000 BCE, before the Common Era. The religion grew organically from a mingling of traditions among native peoples on the Indian subcontinent. It is the world's largest, third largest religion. In the Hindu tradition, God is considered infinite, boundless, and all-encompassing. As humans, we are incapable of understanding the true nature of God, and so the multitude of gods help humans connect with the divine. As we shall see, I will talk about three supreme deities, Shiva, Vishnu, and Devi. This image of Shiva dates from the 10th to early 11th century. It's made of granite. It's a very large sculpture, almost life-size. It would be placed in a temple and is obviously much too heavy to be moved. Here we see Shiva sitting in a peaceful position known as royal ease. And you see that he has one leg tucked up and the other is relaxed and goes over the lotus throne. And you can see where he sits, almost sculpted, scalloped shapes representing the lotus flower. 
A lotus plant grows in the mud, but then the pure white flower rises above the dirt so that the lotus becomes a symbol of purity. Next slide, please. Unusually, in this sculpture, Shiva has four faces. He is all seeing. Notice also that there is a vertical mark on each of the foreheads. This is Shiva's third eye. When Shiva opens this eye, this eye fire is released, which annihilates the known world. Shiva is a destroyer, but he destroys only to create and renew. He's both the destroyer and the preserver. This dichotomy is seen throughout his image. Notice how his hair is piled up and matted dreadlocks, which suggests renunciation. However, the dreadlocks are held in place with a jeweled crown. He also wears mismatched earrings. One earring is elongated, the other is round. Male and female are represented, but Shiva transcends both. Next slide, please. Notice also that the hand on the left holds a rosary and the other hand holds a lotus. And he reaches down in a gesture of welcome. The destroyer peacefully welcomes us. Next slide, please. He's richly dressed and he wears a sacred thread which you can see across his torso. He's elaborately adorned with jewels befitting his high status. Next slide, please. Here we have another image of Shiva, a small metal image. Shiva with the moon in his crown. The crescent moon symbolizes a passage of time, and yet Shiva transcends time. This small metal sculpture would be used very differently from the granite Shiva. This piece is designed to be carried in a procession or worshipped in a temple shrine. We see some of the same identifiers of Shiva, the important third eye and the mismatched earrings, for example, and the piled up dreadlocked hair. However, this Shiva carries different attributes. In his top right hand, he holds an ax to cut through ignorance but his other hand is raised in a gesture of welcome and reassurance. His top left hand holds an antelope, signifying he is Lord of all creatures. But at the same time, he's a transcendent God. In both images, seeming, trans seeming contradictions are united and transcended. Now, he may be a transcendent God, but he's also a family man. He's married to poverty and they have two sons, Skanda and Ganesha. Skanda is the god of war. Next slide, please. And Ganesha, their other son, is known as the removal of obstacles. Believers turn to him in times of transition. Starting school, for example, getting a new job, getting married, anything that is a change or a challenge in life. Uh, by the way, this piece is on loan, as you see, and it is brilliantly displayed and lit in the Southeast Asian Gallery. So, so Jill, we see the, uh, here how Joe, you can really see that he can remove obstacles. Uh, the, the way that sculpture, the personification of uh, that ability. Uh, yes. Of the God. Yes, and we see him dancing in place, pounding. He's clearing the way, the clearing the path ahead. It's a wonderful piece. 
Next slide, please. Here's poverty, Ganesha's mother, Shiva's consort. Look at how her voluptuous body sways in a gentle curve and she wears richly decorated clothing. Next slide, please. And I think you can see here how the clothing is detailed. The decoration is very detailed. And I understand it's so detailed and realistic that we can learn about textiles at the time. Not only does she wear luxurious clothing, but she's adorned with real jewels. Both the small metal image of Shiva and this image of poverty would be worshipped quite differently from the stone sculptures of deities in temples. They're designed to be carried in ritual processions where the gods and goddesses are taken to visit the people. You can see loops on the base of the poverty sculpture. And by the way, you can see she also stands on a lotus, again, the symbol of purity. Now these loops at the base serve a very practical purpose. Rods will be threaded through the rings to enable the image to be carried in a procession. So now it's time to explore how Hindu believers worship. As we said earlier, the deities and their stories enable we humans to come to a greater understanding of the divine. Darshan, which means looking in a very special sense, is fundamental. Devotees do not worship idols. On the contrary, they believe that the God is actually present in the sculpture. When you look the deity in the eyes, the deity is present and sees you. This sacred eye contact is called Darshan. This takes place in temples or homes or in processions. Next slide, please. The metal Shiva and Pavdi that we have seen are made to be paraded. However, first, the deity is prepared for this procession. It's bathed in milk and other special substances, and then adorned with real clothing, flowers, and real jewelry. The adornment is part of worshiping and honoring the deity. In the ritual procession, the god or goddess comes to the people so they may take darshan. So they may look the image in the eye and be seen by the god or goddess. Next slide, please. And now we come to Vishnu. Whereas Shiva is called a destroyer, Vishnu is the preserver. He maintains cosmic balance and returns order to the universe. Notice how his feet are firmly and evenly planted. He is balanced. This is a stele, which simply means that the main image is in the center and others surround it. The sculpture was made to occupy a niche in the wall of a temple. Not only do other figures surround Vishnu, but it almost looks as if he has a halo. So let's take a closer look. Next slide, please. The two upper figures on the columns are Brahma, creation, upper left, and Shiva, upper right, signifying that in this context, they're considered less important than the preserver, Vishnu. And then the larger figures on the lower left is a personification of the conch shell, and the discus. Each of these would have been carried in a hand. You know, it's interesting, Joe, that yeah. Shiva, who is the personification of sort of the existence of, or the, the condition of life, right? Destruction, the cycles of life and everything else, yes. is considered minor to uh, this particular god who represents balance, brings balance. I, I think that's an interesting aspect 
to the Hindu religion. The, uh, and I think it's, on, the emphasis on balance. Yes. However, it does depend a little bit on the temple, the context. In this particular case, that in this context, Shiva and Brahma are not as important as Vishnu. But that's not always the case. Okay. Next slide, please. Here we have front and back view, as you see. Remember that Vishnu, this image of Vishnu, was made to be placed inside a niche in a wall of a temple. And then if we look on the left image here, he holds a mace. And he was created originally with four hands and arms. But at that, the one holding the mace is the only one that remains. But we know from other depictions of Vishnu that the others, the other arms, hands, would have held a conch shell, a discus, and a lotus. The conch shell produces a primordial sound of the universe, Om. The discus symbolizes the mind and the lotus flower, purity. At his feet, there are two small figures which are two human figures in perpetual worship. They might have been patrons of the sculptor. Next slide, please. Now across the top are 10 avatars or forms of Vishnu, each of which refers to one of the stories associated with the god. For example, in the middle, we can see a figure, half man, half animal. This relates to the fact that an evil king was granted a wish that man could not be destroyed, that he could not be destroyed. So Vishnu, in the form of his avatar, created half man, half animal, so that, yes, the evil king could be destroyed. Joe, I think that's a wonderful story that uh, Vishnu came down as half man and half animal because uh, the king was granted the wish that he couldn't be destroyed by man or animal. So, okay, we'll put them together and, and yes. that's it for you. It's a wonderful example of balance. Exactly. And then if you look on the left of the avatars at the top, you can see the fish, Vishnu as a fish. And as a fish, the story is that he rescued the ancient sacred texts, the Vedas. Another avatar is the boar, just about three along, yeah, there, named Varaha. When the boar saw that the earth was being overcome by water, he lifted her up and saved her from drowning. All the stories emphasize the fact that Vishnu is a preserver. He will come to earth to restore balance as necessary. Next slide, please. My last piece is this yogini. Late 9th or early 10th century, you notice. So let's look at what we see. A yogini is both alluring and threatening. She has an idealized voluptuous beauty, which is reminiscent of poverty. And look at the jewels she wears around her waist and around her neck. And she wears a crown. However, in contrast to her beauty, she has hideous fangs, bulging eyes, and is actually adorned with snakes. In her hand, she holds a cup fashioned out of the cut, hollowed out skull of a human being, and she sits on a headless corpse. Next slide, please. Here in this detail, on the right, we can see her hand holding the cup made out of a skull. We can see her bracelet of snakes and that she wields a club on the left. 
but she also holds a shield. Yoginis are both ferocious and protective. Next slide, please. Yoginis are worshipped in a special kind of circular open air temple where there are dozens of yoginis lining the walls and facing inward toward the center point. Both poverty and the yogini are manifestations of the supreme goddess Shakti or Devi. Poverty is a peaceful form and the yogini is a fierce form. The devotee in the yogini temple is surrounded by the power of Shakti, literally surrounded by Shakti or Devi. Next slide, please. And here we can just simply see how the statue is made to be viewed only from the front. She sits in a niche in the wall of the temple. Next slide, please. So yoginis must be worshipped according to specific rites. Only those who are initiated can worship them properly. They grant special powers to the initiates, but are very dangerous to others. And just a concluding side note about the word yoga. Historically, it's quite different from what we understand by yoga. Historically, it means to harness the power of the divine. A yogini harnesses that divine power. Thank you. Christine, are there any questions? That terrific presentation. We have a few comments, uh, thank yous, and appreciation for covering some of the artworks in, um, in this collection. So um, no specific questions though, thank you. Thanks so much, Jill, that was very informative. Well, the next slide, uh, uh, is a painting that's in the same gallery as uh, Jill was just covering, the Indian and Southeast Asian gallery. This is an expression, expressionist style painting completed in the 1980s by one of the most important, celebrated, and influential figures of modern in Indian art. The artist is Makbul Faida Hussein, or MF Hussein. And this is one of two contemporary pieces that hangs in that gallery. Now the title is, um, it, it says it's untitled, but it's the story of Arjuna and Krishna. The painting is large. It's almost three feet tall and over six feet wide. It's acrylic uh, and oil on canvas and it is uh, generously on loan to the DIA. Uh, and when you walk into that gallery, it just pops at you. It's really a very, it's a stunning painting. Born in 1915, MF Hussein was Muslim, who painted various subjects, a range of subjects, including Hindu gods and goddesses, as well as secular subjects. Many of his paintings represent scenes or figures tied to Indian history or religious traditions, and all his efforts uh, were to communicate with the Indian people. Picasso greatly influenced Hussein early in his artistic career. Indeed, as a young painter, Hussein was an active member of the Bombay Progressive Artists Group, who sought to break from tradition and created paintings that were both alive and original. Next slide, Kathleen. This group of artists was greatly inspired by two then modern artistic movements. The first was Cubism, and its two-dimensional style was of a great influence. On the left is a Cubist work from the DIA's Picasso collection. The second movement was Expressionism, particularly the movement's bold colors and simple shapes. On the right is an Expressionist work from the DIA's outstanding collection of German Expressionist art. Next slide, please. You can see those influences in this painting with its flat perspective, simple shapes, and bold colors, all designed to be evocative and to be emotionally provo provoking. Now this painting is from a series of works that Hussein did based upon the ancient epic called Mahabharat, 
which details a great war between two <laughs> rival factions of the Kuru clan. Here we have Ajuna, the painting's main figure, standing in front of a chariot with no driver or charioteer, and he appears to be charging into battle. Najuna, um, Arjuna, excuse me, is experiencing moral confusion on the battlefield due to the violence and harm caused in combat against his kin. He is struggling to understand the consequences to himself of harming and killing members of his own family. His charioteer or chariot driver had been Krishna, who at that moment reveals himself not to be human, but to be a god, and is represented in the painting by the hand, you can see it's being outlined here, by that hand with a radiant discus above the white horse. Krishna advises Arjuna and helps him reach moral clarity. Arjuna's duty is to restore order, and he must fulfill that duty, even if it requires him to murder his own family and face those consequences. You'll note that there's text on the upper part of the painting, and that contains the beginning of a famous quote. Uh, it, um, it's spoken by Krishna to Arjuna, quote, Whenever there is a decay of righteousness, then I myself come forth, end of quote. This story is a strong metaphor for the struggle of our soul when we, face, when we are faced with conflicting and compelling moral obligations. Any questions, Christine? Thank you, Ray, for presenting this contemporary piece. There is, there was one comment, in fact, um, uh, about loans. And I know you have mentioned that uh, this is on loan. Uh, yes. From, from a Detroit family who- Yes, um, it is. From Raj and Padma Vatiakuti. And, and actually they're, they're, they're um, and the elephant looking uh, sculpture was also on loan from yes. them. Actually the gallery, the Indian and Southeast Gallery is named after them because of their generous contributions. Mm -hmm. They're huge supporters of the museum. And uh, one, one of the viewers was wondering uh, about um, when we talk about pieces that are on loan, but um, everybody um, can know that when we do receive pieces on loan from uh, families uh, like um, this family, we are able to share them with all of you publicly because their family allows us to. Great. Um, should we go to the Chinese art gallery? Well, there was, wait, oh, hold, on, Ray, hold on. There was one more question. If we have a minute, it was actually uh, for Jill and it was um, uh, Parvati and it's uh, about her hand gestures and if they have a specific meaning. I'm just going to go back. There we go. Uh, yes, the raised hand is a sign of reassurance and welcome. And the lower hand, I don't know if that has a specific meaning or whether it just adds to the, the general relaxed um, posture it certainly is an elegant posture yes 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 but the raised hand is again it's it's welcome reassurance safety if you like terrific okay frida okay thank you ray in this segment we'll look at works from the chinese gallery which contains art from three and a half thousand years ago up to the mid 20th century. We'll view a handful of works made during times when China was ruled by imperial families. Bronzes from the Shang Dynasty around 3000 years ago, ceramics from the Tang Dynasty from 1300 years ago, and two paintings, one from the Ming and one from the Qing dynasty from over 450 years ago. 
We'll talk about trade with Central Asia that vastly increased during the 600s to early 900s when routes to China, now called the Silk Road, spanned an area from Antioch in Damascus in current day Syria to Eastern Chinese cities. And from these works of art, we'll learn some of the social practices, history, and beliefs that characterized elite Chinese culture over time. The next slide shows one of the earliest works in the gallery, a bronze ritual vessel from about 1388 to 1122 BCE. Vessels like these were used in feasts held by families to honor their ancestors. These feasts involved food and drink, but this vessel and the ones in the next slide were most likely used for wine. The wine vessel, the ritual wine vessel, or dre, was cast with three legs, like a three-footed stool. Three-legged stools are stable on ground that's uneven, and you want a stable receptacle because you would be heating this vessel and its contents over a fire. You can also see that there are two arms that jut out on top for ease in lifting and pouring from the hot vessel. Feasts typically took place in a building near the tomb. In addition to family members banqueting, it was believed that the ancestors would enjoy the chi or inner energy or essence of the food and drink offerings as well. Once the feast and funerary rites were over, this ancient vessel was then placed in the tomb to ensure the deceased's safe and happy passage into the spiritual realm. Having vessels buried in the tomb would also allow relatives to continue to make offerings to their ancestors. Looking at these three bronze vessels, you might be surprised at the different shapes that were used for serving wine. Over 30 types of ritual vessels have been unearthed, which held food and wine. And because bronze was an expensive material, these vessels would have belonged to elite individuals. The next slide shows the most prevalent Shang bronze motif, the Tao Tia, or ferocious animal mask. There's one on the Jue we saw, but here's a better depiction of a Tao Tia, which art historians have found on many Shang bronzes. This Tao Tia is displayed in the case next to the wine vessels and is made of bronze with inlaid pieces of turquoise. The Tao Tia has eyes, ears, and horns, and is a mythical beast, perhaps meant to frighten away evil and to spell evil spirits. It was made around the same time as the bronze ritual vessels. Let's turn now to works of ceramic art from the Tahang Dynasty, which lasted from 618 to 906. Some of the roots of the Silk Road can be seen here. And this important set of trade routes led to the international look of many ceramics made during the Tang Dynasty. Although trade between China and Central Asia had taken place for several hundred years before this, it was during the Tang Dynasty that trade expanded massively. On the eastern end of the Silk Road's land route was the Tang, capital city of Chang'an, now called Qi'an. It's located on the Yellow River and was one of the largest cities in the world at the time. Have you ever been to the DIA's Gallery of Art from Paris in the 1920s? Almost 100 years ago, Paris was the center of international arts and culture. And a School of Paris gallery shows the dramatic change that took place in Western art with groundbreaking works by artists like Picasso, Matisse, Modigliani. Similarly, Chang'an during the Tang Dynasty was the international hotspot with traders, musicians, dancers, merchants, and religious adepts and novices coming from places like Syria, Persia, Arabia, India, Tibet, 
Korea, Japan, and Southeast Asia. Travelers from Central Asia brought ideas on dress, different types of music played on new instruments, and new forms of dance and religion. The Chinese were fascinated by this influx, so Tang artists created ceramic pieces that highlight the latest fashions. Tell us of the latest rage in sports, such as polo, which was played by aristocratic men and women. And they tell us about an exotic animal, the camel, which wasn't indigenous to China, but carried trade items from Central Asia along the Silk Road. The ceramics shown in these slides would have been used as burial objects called Ming Qi, which means spirit utensils. Ming Qi were used for about 1100 years, up until about 900, or roughly the end of the Tang Dynasty. Like the Shang Dynasty bronzes, these Tang ceramics were also found in burial sites. But unlike the Shang bronzes, Ming Qi were ceramic figurines buried with deceased relatives to provide the afterlife with everything they would have enjoyed while they were alive. Ming Qi from earlier times might have shown servants, farm animals, workers, and even buildings. Also, because Ming Qi are very animated and naturalistic looking, these objects were believed to contain the essence of the real thing. Frida, I just think yes. it's fascinating that you uh, that in the Chinese belief, the Chinese culture at that time, they would put these statues in, uh, you know, with those that they were burying. And then if you go, you know, down the hall to the Egyptian, they did the same, a different culture, you know, um, unlikely to have uh, necessarily, you know, uh, influenced each other at that, at that particular time. And, you, and they did the same thing in their tombs with, uh, in, you know, the, the sculptures that were to aid the, um, the dead in the afterlife. And then if you keep going down the hall to our Native Americans, you have these wood mm -hmm. dogs, right, Frida, that mm -hmm. they would bury with the yes. dead yes. in the, what, what is now the Mexican region of, uh, you know, uh, Central America or Absolutely. North America, North America. So I think it's just fascinating that that's, sort of a human sentiment to have yes. buried yeah. these sculptures mm -hmm. with the... Mm -hmm. with That's the, a great um, point. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just think it's, it's, it's just an interesting, yes. very interesting. And it, the way they get in this gallery, the way they're all presented is very fascinating. It is. That's a great point, Ray. Thank you very much. It really points to uh, a lot of commonalities amongst humanity, really. Yeah. It is. It's, it's kind of like a, a human, uh, a fundamental human sentiment. Interesting. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, in addition, unlike Ming Qi from earlier times, Tang Dynasty Ming Qi were noted for the distinctive glazes and for the infusion of new ideas from Central Asia. These are just a small number of Ming Qi that we have in the DIA uh, from the Tang Dynasty. We also have pieces from earlier eras uh, where our Ming Qi uh, are in the form of musicians, dancers, tomb guardians, etc. So please come down to the museum and see this for yourselves. Look at this colorful depiction of the camel and lady with phoenix headdress. The glaze is called Sankai, developed during the late 7th century. And Sankai literally means three colors, green, yellow, and cream. And these are the color that are so characteristic of Tang Dynasty ceramics. Glazes added to the cream or white colored clay were made from copper, which created the shades of green, and iron, which created amber or yellow. Later in the mid eighth century, blue glaze made from cobalt began to be used in these pieces. Cobalt blue came from Central Asian places like Iraq, and was very expensive. So ceramics containing blue glazes would have been much more rare. Glazes don't just enhance the look of the finished ceramic, but can help us better see various features, such as the two humps on this back trained camel, or its long legs and graceful neck. In the next slide, 
the green glaze focuses her attention on the upturned shoes, called a cloud shoe, of the lady with phoenix headdress, as well as her short-sleeved top and the deep neckline of her robe. Um, before I go on to the last two works of work, Christine, are there any questions from the audience? Person typing Maybe. in China with an exclamation point. So uh, I think they're pretty excited that you're presenting. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's look at our last couple of slides. And this is the first of two Chinese landscape paintings that we'll view. Um, Cold Mountains and Snowy Peaks by Lan Ying is from the early Qing dynasty, which rules from 1644 to 1912. Lan Ying is imitating the style of Fan Guan, a famous artist whose well-known paintings come from around the year 1000 during the Song dynasty. He painted such realistic depictions of nature that people felt transported into the scenes he drew. Imitating the works of masterpieces in China is felt to provide a form of honoring a great artist, a way of learning how to paint well, and does not have the same negative connotation that copying Western artwork carries. The reason we'll look at two paintings is that there are many ways to read and enjoy Chinese landscape, and, and viewing these will provide a brief introduction on what to look for. Landscape paintings in Chinese are called shan sui, or mountain water, and they offer an opportunity to create visual poems about the beauty of nature and a person's relationship to it. Imagine entering this scene, embark on a journey, and interact with things in nature that you encounter. Cross the bridge, as if you were the traveler riding on a horse. Wander the riverbank by the pine trees and travel along the bank and up the mountain. Imagine the views from various vantage points, such as the pavilion. Jill presented this painting earlier this year <laughs> and asked, what sounds would you hear if you were in this landscape? And my docent colleagues came up with the following, chirping birds gusting winds, the sounds of running water, ice crackling, horses' hooves plodding through the snow, and the gentle thunks of snow blowing off the trees and onto the ground. Recall our earlier mention of funerary objects, such as the Tang Dynasty ceramics, where people believe that the figurines carried qi, or spirit essence of the real thing. In Chinese landscape paintings, Imagine that the artist has imbued each rock, each leaf, the running water, and the entire mountain with the kind of chi or spirit essence which allows you to commune with nature. With that thought in mind, let's turn to our last piece, a painting that was created about 100 years earlier, the first posed poem on the Red Cliff. This landscape painting was made by the noted scholar official and antiquarian Wen Zengming in 1558. He was 88 years old at the time and passed away the following years. He lived during the Ming Dynasty, which ruled from 1368 to 1644. In this scene, Wen Zengming depicts the famous poet Su Dongbo, also known as Su Xie, with friends in a boat drifting on a moonlit night on the Yangtze River at the site of a famous naval battle that took place around 220 CE. Frida, is that the poem above? Is this, is this painting sort of the illustration? Absolutely, of the poem? yes. And that is the poetic exposition that Su Xie has, uh, had written and Wen Zhenming has written across the top. Good eye, thank you. Um, so, uh, Su was with his friends in a boat, drifting on a moonlit night on the Yangtze River at the site of a famous naval battle that took place around 220. After Su Xie visited the site with his friends in the year 1082, he wrote his well-known poetic exposition on the Red Cliff. 
Here's a short summary of the battle that Susha and his companions have been discussing. General Cao Cao was one of the greatest warlords towards the end of the Han Dynasty, which lasted from 206 BCE to 220 CE. He attempted to unite the kingdom under his rule and brought a fleet of ships down the Yangtze River to invade the kingdom of Wu, met by a coalition of three kingdoms united to defeat him at Red Cliff. They succeeded in setting fire to the invading ships, which were roped together. And so Cao Cao's entire fleet was burned. Su Xie and his friends likely knew and recited these lines that Cao Cao had written before his demise. How long can a man's life last? I liken it to morning's dew, and the days now past are too many. If we try to imagine ourselves in the scene, as we did with the previous painting, where would you go? The sight Red Cliff looks to be impenetrable. It's overhanging the river and there's no place to dock. The riverbank shown in front uh, or towards the bottom of the painting also looks forbidding as the spiky branches and boulders don't present a welcome place to land. Perhaps we're meant to identify with Su Shi and his companions. They're drinking wine listening to one of the friends playing a melancholy tune on his float, thinking of what happened 800 years earlier, feeling nostalgic and full of sorrow. It's so interesting, Frida, that these paintings convey those feelings and sens sensations with just ink and some watercolor. Yes. Unlike Western art, yes. at the mm -hmm. time you had like the Dutch landscape paintings, which are vivid colors and you know very realistic representations mm -hmm. it's so um it's, it's it's interesting to me how as you were putting it you could you really can identify with what's going on in a much That's different true. way great great point and i should point out that um so one Zen name was a, a a scholar official and the scholar officials sought to um uh distance themselves from the professional painters who did use color. So the uh, literati tended to put in symbols um, that the literati would have been uh, familiar with. So um, they would, uh, so the traveler uh, or people meeting in a pavilion or friends um, might have referred to friends they were seeing for maybe the last time or hadn't seen in a long time, or they're both together because they no longer work for the government. They're sort of um, looking to have a different life. Um, uh, the, the dynasty before the Ming, the Song dynasty, or a couple of dynasties before then, um, had been overcome by the Yuan dynasty, that's the dynasty of Ging, Ging, Chinggis Khan. And a lot of the scholar officials there um, were very, very well known for uh, literati paintings that painted these feelings, these images. Uh, and a lot of times the images might contain a mixture of Taoist, Confucian principles, and things like that. So they're all imbued with a lot of meaning. So, so thank you. So, um, so Susha and his friends were in the boat, uh, and uh, they're sort of feeling melancholy and full of sorrow. And uh, this comes to your point, uh, Ray, because why are they feeling melancholy? Because in a Chinese landscape painting, you'll find a lot of allegories. A person in a boat is usually not just fishing, not just drinking wine, not just listening to music, but meditating on life. In his poem, Su Xie says to his friends, we go riding a boat as small as a leaf and raise goblets of wine to toast one another. We are but mayflies lodging between heaven and earth, single grains adrift, far out on the dark blue sea. We grieve that our lives only last a moment and we covet the endlessness of the great river. However, Su Xie's exposition ends on a positive note. Don't look at it from the point of view of everything changing, he says. 
think of things not changing. From that viewpoint, people and things never come to an end. There's nothing to covet, only the cool breeze along with the bright moon, and these we can take as our own and they will never be used up. Thus said, he and his friends return to the moment and enjoy the scenery in themselves and nature. So let's take a look at the last close-up slide of Su Shep and his friends in the boat. He has just suggested a different vantage point of things not changing. When Sung Ming captures that exact moment when everyone brightens up and begins to enjoy the scenery and their exchange of thoughts that make lives meaningful. Although this painting has not been on view since 2018 when the gallery opened, <clears throat> excuse me, it'll be exhibited again in September 2022 for only six months. This is because light sensitive artwork like this can only be viewed for a short time and then must be stored for several years. <clears throat> so come and see this Chinese masterpiece, ponder the complexities of life and immerse yourself in its feeling of sweet relaxation. So before I close, um, I'd like to thank Catherine Kasdorf and Frank Chen for helping uh, with this presentation. Uh, back to you, Ray. Thanks. So um, this contemporary painting was created by the Chinese master of post-World War II abstraction, Zhao Wu Qi, who created unique works shaped by diverse influences. Throughout his long career, Zhao Wu Qi explored oil on canvas, ink on paper, engraving and watercolor, allowing each image to evolve from the next without imposing boundaries. As an artist, he lived up to his given name, Wu Qi, or no limits. So this particular painting also uh, is uh, doesn't have a title or is untitled. It's from 1957. It's uh, almost 32 inches tall and it's over seven feet wide. So it's a very large oil on canvas painting. Born in China in 1921, Zhao Wuqi learned traditional Chinese calligraphy at a very young age. He attended art school in China and studied Chinese ink painting, like Frida had just shown, as well as European drawing and oil painting. He then moved to Paris in uh, 1948, and he eventually became a French citizen. Zhao Wuqi became known for combining traditional aspects of Chinese culture and abstract expressionism. Next slide, please. Abstract Expressionism was an American-born movement that became extremely popular, actually internationally popular, and the first real international movement that was started in America. And it, it took off after World War II. Uh, this painting uh, by an American is an, uh, an example of abstract expressionism from the DIA's collection. So, Zawa Ki's uh, painting, the painting that we were just lo looking at, uh, uh, combines abstraction with Chinese calligraphy. Could you go to the next slide, please? This work from the DIA's collection is an example of 17th century Chinese calligraphy. Historically, in Chinese culture, calligraphy and painting developed alongside one another and, sh and shared many similarities. For the Chinese, the, quote, three, three perfections, as they were known, were calligraphy, poetry, and painting. And the first pro prose poem on the Red Cliff that Frida just showed combines all three of them, or the three perfections. As you can see in this work, calligraphy exhibits brush strokes that have traces of the artist's hand. The strokes convey energy and emotion. In fact, in 1956, Zawuki is quoted as saying, quote, calligraphy is the orig original source and the only guide for my painting, end of quote. Next slide, please. 
So note that this untitled painting it has bold, energetic brushstrokes that bears a relationship to the forms of Chinese calligraphy. Both color and energy of brushstroke were important to Zhao Wuqi's expression of emotion. The artist actually gave this painting to his uh, brother and sister-in-law to fit over their mantle. Uh, he was living with them in Montclair, New Jersey for a few months while coping with the difficult disillusion of his first marriage. He later came to realize that this painting reflected his then emotional state. Uh, this painting actually was a series of paintings that Zhao Wuqi completed after the disillusion of his marriage. Of these paintings, he later observed, quote, I gradually realized that what I was painting resembled what was happening inside me. Looking at the finished paintings, I was surprised to find they expressed anger, tranquility, violence, and then again, calm. My paintings became emotional because I shamelessly displayed my feelings and moods." End of quote. This is a spectacular painting that is actually hung above uh, calligraphy, Japanese, I'm sorry, Chinese calligraphy uh, in the Chinese gallery. And it's a wonderful um, contemporary contrast to the ancient scripts. Christine, any questions? Thank you, Ray, that was terrific. Uh, we do have one question and it's reg in regards to the talk in general. We spoke so much about uh, Hindu traditions and all the many gods and uh, the viewer is wondering whether all of the gods contained attributes of both female and male gender. Um, not all, no. Um, Shiva is particularly known for that because his essential nature, he destroys in order to create, but Poverty, for example, is all female. And there are other female gods as well. So, okay. Said, Thank you said, for that clarification. I hope that open, that answers the question. Mm -hmm. yep. And then there is a question uh, for Frida. Actually, the viewer would like to see the piece that's in storage that's coming out in 2022 since it's not on view right now. So I think we need to go back a few slides. Okay. So um, yes, yeah. that's the that's the piece that will coming be coming out next year. Uh -huh. And I think it was chosen to be uh, placed in the gallery when it first reopened in uh, November 2018 because it is such an important piece. So, uh, yes, uh, I do invite everybody to come. It's going to be almost a year before it comes out. But plan your calendar for next year and uh, come by and see it. Absolutely. And I know that uh, our curator, Catherine Kasdorf, does rotate most of these works on paper every six months. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, the... Um, the ink, uh, it's all light sensitive and, you know, that's that's the reason that these have to be put to rest for a while. And so it will have been really uh, four years uh, that it will be in storage before it comes out again. Mm -hmm. And only for a short time. Six months. So, um, yeah, we've got a small window of opportunity to see it again. That's right. Thank you. Um, I should perhaps just elaborate a little bit about the Hindu goddesses. As we've seen, uh, poverty is linked to Shiva, but Saraswati, she is the wife of Brahma, and Lakshmi is linked to Vishnu. So there are definite powerful female deities. Thank you, Joe. Well, if we have no other questions, I, uh, our time is about up, and I want to thank Frida and Joe for uh, just a wonderful presentation. Um, it was fun. Yeah, well, it was great, it was great to listen to, that's, that's for sure. Uh, next week, uh, 
Thursdays at the museum, we'll have another virtual tour. It's uh, Seeking the Sacred, uh, presented by docents Kathleen McBroom and Deb um, Combs. So you should definitely want, uh, tune into that. It, it'll be an interesting um, tour uh, with uh, many pieces from Western, typically from Western culture, but from other cultures too. And it, it, it talks about uh, the kinds of work, works that are, are typically worship pieces or religious pieces. In any event, thank you for tuning in and uh, hopefully you'll uh, have time next week. And until then, stay well. Thank you so much.